He makes the papers as often as the biggest names in the game and he's been retired for more than 30 years. He is the somewhat reluctant star of the long-running footy show with a unique capacity to say and do things on and off screen that land him in hot water. He is the man who has been described by various footy show hosts for 20 years as the 300-game superstar from Geelong, John Sammy Newman. Welcome, John. <laughs> it's an interesting ensemble, mate. Oh, thanks for wel welcoming <laughs> me, Mick. And what do you mean mm. it's an interesting ensemble? Well, the shorts, the shoes. Oh, coming from the uh, house model for the brother of St Lawrence. What's, what's wrong with what I'm wearing? I knew you'd say that. I knew, <laughs> I knew when I asked that question, so you got exactly notes. the response I'd get. So you've got notes, but you, you know exactly what you're going to ask me. Why have you got those? Uh, well, because I'm a bit nervous about to you're being sitting across The only time you. I've ever seen you nervous is over a two-foot <laughs> putt when you were trying to save $12.50 on the last <laughs> hole down at Kingswood. Yeah, that's Kingswood. It's a while since we've been there. How are you travelling in your 67th how long we've year, old-timer? Hmm? How are you travelling in your 67th year? Slowly, very slowly, Mick. You look well. No, you do. Oh, Apart well. from the shoes, you look well. Well, what's wrong with now, Mick? Let's get this out of the way. What's wrong with the shoes? And they're I like they're to, different. They're different. Well, I like to cut compartmentalise my toes <laughs> in case when I get home some of them are missing. Things are dropping off me just at a large rate. Including your weight. I mean, you look slim, sleek. What, uh, have you lost weight? Yeah, look, I'm sorry for trying to keep fit in my <laughs> elder and latter years because um, I'm trying to join the rest of society who are slowly becoming obese. So <laughs> I'm going to go out and try and put lots on after this. What do you do, though, to enjoy your free time? Well, my free time, yeah. I enjoy boating. And I play yeah. a little golf, got mm -hmm. back into playing golf. Yep, you have. And uh, just chat with the one or two friends that I have on a regular basis. Mm. Your golf, I mean, it troubled you for a long time. I always thought that golf caused you more angst than your football. Caused me more angst. It did. Now Indeed. you're playing off, what, 14 or 15? Yes, one of those. And content with that? Very content, Mick. Yes, I am very content. Uh, golf mm. really got to me because I thought I was better than I was or I thought I should be better than I was, mm. you but I wasn't. Your demeanour on the golf course has raised a few eyebrows over yes, the years. Yes, it has. Yeah. has. Not something I'm proud of. I used to throw clubs and cuss. Cuss. <laughs> now I cuss a little, try mm. and do it uh, not with an earshot of the general membership of the golf club because mm. that's not a welcome thing. I uh, th haven't thrown a club for 10 years mm. uh, because you get home and you think, how stupid is that? Are friends important to you? Do you, do you have a lot of friends and do you cultivate I don't them? I don't. No, I don't have a lot of friends and I certainly don't cultivate friends. Mm. I cultivate the friends that I have. I yep. think it's worth putting the time in with friends that you have, but I don't think it's worth putting the time into people who are just acquaintances. Yeah, I, I get the impression from the 25 years that I've known you that you're not a big rap for most of the inhabitants of planet Earth. Is that fair? I, I'm, I'm not, not interested in what they're doing. I'm not interested in them, no, but nor are they with me. I'm, I have no interest in what other people are doing, as long as they leave me alone, but <laughs> they usually don't. Um, no, I don't cultivate friends. I'm a bit antisocial, but that's just, that's the way we are, Mick. Shane Warne was one Shane of your Warne. friends, is one of your friends. What's the status of that relationship? You were very tight with Warney. Is that still the case? Uh, uh, well, I, I would hope so. Uh, Shane has moved on to the international field, uh, he has moved on to the international stage and um, I think, don't think has a hell of a lot of time for um, um, local people because he's not here. I'm getting the feeling you feel that you might have been snubbed a bit. No, I'm not snubbed at all, not at all. Uh, the former Premier, Mr Kennett, he, now I know he's a golf partner of yours and you do, you've always spoken positively about yes. Geoffrey Kennett. Yes, I have. Do you think that sounds like him? A little. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> oh, what do you mean little? I yeah. think it really, from inside here, it yeah, sounds you, like you. I know you like yes, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hello, Sam. What have you been doing? <laughs> do you want to go over golf? He's an interesting character, isn't he? He is. Uh, he is uh, an obscure, diverse, and lateral man, and did great things for this. Uh, now we're not getting political, but yep. he did great things for this state. And uh, I'm not sure how great he was at Hawthorne, and I say that uh, without being smart or 
taking any stick to him. Uh, but he's a very nice man, good company. We, we see him publicly. Yes. Oh, the, the public persona, everyone knows that. But he's a different in he private, is. is he not? He is. Mm. A jovial man. Uh, doesn't take himself too seriously. Mm. What do you think of all the do-gooders who ridicule you for your brash, even crass comments? That uh, That's the perception that they have. Like what? Uh, well, I, I suppose, fundamentally, street talk. If you saw... It sounds like I'm uh, defending myself too much. I really get sick and tired, not of that question, but I get sick and tired of the vocal minority, those people out there who have no idea what's going on, live in their own little world. I, along with a camera crew, and we've been doing this for 19 mm. years, we go out and speak to everyday people on the street. Some of them are simple, not as in simply stupid, they are simple folk just wandering along the street. If they don't want to speak to us, don't speak to us. We never harass people or ask people to speak to us, but you'd be amazed at how many what you would call simple folk come and speak to us and can't get enough of it. Mm. Is that a crime? Is that belittling people? I never take them to task about their mentality or their intellect. I have a chat to them. That speaks for itself. And if, I, if we put on uh, street talk on the footy show, some of the stuff that people do and say to us, it, it, I tell you what, we would, we could sell it around the world. Sammy, mama, I got you like this. <laughs> oh, Sammy. I just want to ask you about the criticism of you and the footy show. Now, you always say, you preface all your remarks by saying, I don't mind people having a go at me or the footy show, but they've got to know I'm going to have a go back. But... I am one of many who think that you overcorrect and you become, you sort of, you don't level the score, you just obliterate the target. We've been um, monitored and edited or scrutinised to within an inch of my mm, life because mm, of some of the mm. things I have said. Uh, would I take anything I've said back? No, I wouldn't. Because None you of us. don't Because you don't get a chance to take it back. It's easy to say, oh, I would have taken this back. We do it off the top of our head. We think that's what the appeal of the show is, that it's spontaneous. Mm. And there's plenty of things that I've said that have probably been borderline. Mind you, I don't think most of them, I, most of the things I say are borderline at that time slot and at that, when you see what goes on <laughs> on other mm. programs and other shows, we are pretty tame, to be honest. But people love to take a rise out of me and that's fair enough. What I have said, Mick, is criticise me if you like. I don't mind what you say about me as long as you don't mind what I say <laughs> about you. And you'd be yeah. amazed how that is not a, a two-way street, that. And you know what critics are, Mick? Critics are like eunuchs in a harem. They're there every night, they see it done every night, they see how it should be done, <laughs> but they can't do it themselves. They're what critics are. Okay. Get Just up relax. and have a crack at it. Just, well, no, Sit it's back the, and relax. But you have, you, you, have the, you have the vocal vole, a group of vole, or rats, a group, a minority come up and try and find every single thing you do, uh, something wrong with it. Two more skits. Uh, Shane Crawford pulled your pants down. Did you know that was coming? Not at all. You didn't? Well, did it embarrass you? It, it, of course it did, Mick, for a number <laughs> of reasons. Yeah. Uh, I'd like some warning if I'm going to have my pants pulled mm -hmm. down on live television. <laughs> <laughs> Did David Schwartz have any notice that he was going to get a pie in the face? Um, to an extent, to an extent, I said I might give you, he was a panel member of our show. He was. I said, David, I, I, I might have a, a present for you. For a great 150th, mate, just... <laughs> The boy sprang up mm. and only due to my magnificent physical condition did I not uh, spend that summer in a wheelchair. <laughs> well, people forget that you were a very good footballer, I think. Your citation in the Australian Football Hall of Fame is, to my view, modest. It says, quote, one of Geelong's finest ruckmen, a courageous player who overcame serious injuries and later became a media star. 
Does that do you justice? Mick, if you think I'm going to try and convince people that I was any other player than what they thought I was, you're wrong. I don't care if people think of me. I, I don't agree with that. I think you do care. I know what I was as a yeah. footballer. Yeah. I know what I was. And um, <clears throat> if the perception is that, well, good on him. Well, tell us, describe John Newman, the footballer. I mean, it is, no. it is a long time since you played. It's 30-odd years since you played. Yeah. What, is there someone of the modern era that you no. believe plays the game I'm not the way about you did? to tell you how I played football or how good I was or I wasn't. I'm not about to tell you who I would be like. That is, in the <coughs> eye of the beholder, that is so subjective, uh, uh, me telling you about what sort of football I was, I was. I played for 18 years with Geelong. I missed five years in football terms through injury. That is, I missed mm -hmm. 100 games through injury. Mm -hmm. Kevin Bartlett and I played for 18 years, him for Richmond, me for Geelong, and he played 100 games more than me. He played he 403 yeah. games, I played 303. You're in the Hall of Fame and you're in Geelong's Team of the Century and having seen you play, you deserve both those accolades. Well, that's mighty neighbourly of you, Mick. <laughs> uh, so if you could wander around and every time someone says, you know that clown that you mm -hmm. know me, you sh I want you to say... By the way, he was a very, very good footballer and just see if they laugh. You played the bulk of your career with one kidney, correct? Y yes. Yeah. How difficult was that in the psychological sense, coming back as a, you were young when you were injured? Yes. Um, was, it a, was it a psychological barrier for you? It was, yeah, it was. I did it in the first semi-final in 67 against mm -hmm. Collingwood and then uh, when Polly was there, Polly Farmer, and he left that year, went back to Perth and I took over the mantle as number one ruckman for Geelong in 68. So I had the whole summer to get ready. But it was uh, daunting. And uh, Tom Lonigan, I know, yep. when he uh, suffered the injury a couple of years ago, he found it difficult as well. But you couldn't keep him away from playing football now if you had, you had 100 horses. He, yeah. he loves it. Well, we know in graphic detail of the Lonigan situation, but my memory is that you could have died at the MCG that day that you were hurt. Is that and an exaggeration? A lot of or people not? wish that I had. <laughs> no, I've, um, no, it's not exaggeration. Only in as much as now. Look, let's not make this too hokey or too dramatic. But let's make it factual. All right. Well, I was taken off the ground, mm -hmm. uh, having been collected in the knee by someone from Collingwood, and uh, <coughs> uh, things weren't quite as uh, advanced in those days. I was left in the rooms. This is in the first quarter. I was left in the rooms lying on a stretcher or a rub down table until half time. Oh, that's what they were going to come in and examine me at half time. And my father, God love him, he walked in about 10 minutes before half time. And I think I was the colour of that uh, sheet of paper there. And I said, Could you help me to the urinal? I want to uh, urinate. And uh, he held me up there. And um, I'm sorry about this, but it was pure blood that uh, I uh, urinated. And he went into a uh, bit of a state and uh, they put me in the ambulance and my mother and father got in the back of the ambulance with me. And I can remember this to this day. And they were taking my boots and clothes off. I was still in my football gear. And um, they rushed me in, I think it was to the Alfred, and they had me on a trolley and they swung those doors through into the operating theatre with my mother behind me. And the doctor said, now, look, you can't come in here. We're going to operate on him. And she said, is he all right? He said, it'll be touch and go. I mm. remember her saying that. Mm. I remember him saying that too, it'll be touch and go. Because I had my blood supply replaced twice. I was mm. just internally bleeding. So, Mick, look, I'm here to say that it was a success. Uh, <laughs> my life hasn't been a success, but physically they managed to save me. And here I am. And probably would have been better if they'd just let me go. <laughs> Would have saved a hell of a lot of trouble yeah, probably. from everyone's yeah. point we of view. We mightn't have ever seen the footy show if that had ever happened, though. Wouldn't that have been a delight? Pluses. Wouldn't that have been a bonus? Sam, your parents, um, your father was a uh, master at Geelong Grammar, he correct? He was. Yep. How, how were they about your public persona, your TV persona? Did they live long enough to see you be the person you are on <laughs> Thursday night? It's a very good question. I suppose your parents love you, whoever you are, whoever you turn... Uh, I know my father and mother got a kick out of me playing for Geelong. They love their football, as my two sisters do to this day. But I think uh, much to the chagrin of my mother and father and probably my sisters, they wondered what in the hell they had uh, produced. Um, <laughs> and um, 
my father, who was um, an elderly man, when I started uh, doing the footy show, he used to ring me up and say, what are you doing? <laughs> I'd say, I'll, I'll go, I said, Pops, I'm, I'm, I used to call him Pop. I said, I'm not sure. He said, settle down. So he said, no. Nah. <laughs> so I know, um, I don't know if they thought it was good what I did. I'm sure they didn't think it was good what I did, but they thought, well, that's our son, so um, that's it. We, we can't choose who your parents are, so. Time for a break, Sammy. When we come back, I've got plenty more for you, including who was the better of the Ablets and your thoughts on the modern game. Oh, You've okay. always declared Polly Farmer as the, the greatest player that you've seen. Yes. Certainly the greatest Geelong player and probably no. the greatest player that you've seen. Yes. Now, let me, oh, that's a statement of fact. Let me ask you a harder one. Who of the two Ablets has been a better player? Gary Senior, Gary Junior. Uh, and I hate to use this word again, but this is such a subjective... Uh, well, of course it is. Well, wait, 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 but it is, Mick, uh, because some people like the flair and the uh, excitement and the uh, unpredictability of uh, Gary Ablett Senior, and some people like the honest, real, workmanlike mm. class of his son. So, do you want Gary Ablett... In order for Gary Ablett to take those great marks and do what he did, he has to have someone like his son who gets the ball 50 mm. times a day and kicks it down to him. So I don't think you could separate them. Gary Ablett Sr. was more exciting and is probably what this game's about. Gary Ablett Jr. in modern terms is what this game's about. The 2007 Geelong Premiership ended a huge drought. Yes. I always had the feeling that you weren't as happy with that Premiership as I expected someone would given your history. It, you're not a Bomber Thompson fan, are you? Well, well, now, Mark Thompson is, I think, a very nice man. I have get on very well with him. You do get on well with him, do you? Every time I'm in his company, whether he makes a special effort or not, I don't make a special effort. I, I don't mind if people don't like me, but if we chat, I think I get on well with Bomber Thompson. I think he's a very nice man, so that's that. But I, as my, in a role that I had on the radio, I thought Geelong were playing a pedantic, contrived game of football, which incidentally is the way the game went for a number of mm. years, some years ago. It is starting, in my opinion, to uh, become a better game. But for a period of time there, it became a ridiculous exercise in people trying to show how smart they were, trying to reinvent a wheel that didn't need to be mm. reinvented, uh, bamboozling people and showing that they knew more about the game than the actual people who played it and confused them into the bargain. And I thought Geelong did that in spades. Bomber Thompson, don't forget, is the second longest coach in Geelong's history. 11 years he was there. Mm. Probably lucky to last 11 years, not because he wasn't necessarily any good, because if you don't get success in the first handful of years, you usually get turned over. But Frank Costa and Brian Cook stuck by him. You've softened, you know. You, you, I hear what you're saying. I ain't finished yet. Right, no, no. OK. And then he made some monumental errors, in my opinion, in successive finals that saw them not play in a grand final when they should have. And in the end, he was, in my opinion, in the end, he was just uh, almost counterproductive to Geelong. He was paying lip service to coaching and uh, he had a bigger staff around him who had more influence. Now, when I see him next time out in the street, he'll say, thanks for that, you prick. And I'll say, <laughs> Mark, I still think you're a nice man, but that was my opinion of you as a coach. You give the impression occasionally that you're tormented by the modern game. Is, is that true? I'm, I'm glad I'll get that impression because that is an absolute, uh, that is absolute certainty. The modern game, uh, the modern game went into a, into a state of flux uh, a period some years ago. It's starting just to, in fact, I think the way Geelong played in last year's grand final just was a refreshing uh, insight into the way this game can be played successfully if you get the ball quickly mm. down to the people who win the game for you. That is the forwards, the power forwards. And you'd be amazed at how many people that come through the portals <laughs> of the footy show 
the Jonathan Browns, the Nick Rewalks, the Barry Halls. Uh, there's just singular boys, those, incidentally. Mm. Um, <laughs> Thank uh, you, Gary Ayers. The, Camry, the Cameron Moonies. When he, and the first question I always like to ask, I said, does it confuse you when they don't kick the ball to you? They say the one thing we want them to mm. do when they get it near the centre of the ground is kick it to us first up because... We are good players, they don't say that, but they are good players and more often than not can beat their opponent one out. But, and that's why the game got into a state of confusion. But let me ask you one thing about that. I agree with that. And Do I've, you? I've expressed the same view several times. But if there were a simple way to play this game and win it, why wouldn't 18 coaches be doing it? Well, m m m maybe they don't have the personnel to do it. But people, you've got to play to your strengths, not to your weaknesses, surely. Yeah. Why would you fiddle faddle around dippy dappy football up the ground when you've got dippy dappy dippy mm. dippy dappy? Why would you play football like that when you've got th two or three people standing up the forward end of the ground waiting to have an opportunity to win a game for you and you don't kick it to them? You played with you played with Jack Hawkins and he was a very good player in very your very good player. Are you a believer or non-believer in his son Tommy? Well, it's easy to say we're a believer in Tom now because, uh, incidentally, uh, this is a... Th well, I'm a believer in Tom Hawkins now because I think confidence is everything in this game, particularly when you're a youth. And he was in the wilderness for a couple of years there, but that game on grand final day, the biggest game of the year, last year, the grand final, he suddenly came of age. But I would suggest he came of age because... Chris Scott changed the way those boys played football and they did kick it down to him more often than not and they backed him to get the ball. But I think the greatest thing I've ever seen in football, ever seen in football that changed a game and it's very underrated and underestimated is what Stephen Johnson mm. did when he thought, I will rescue this man, Tom Hawkins, who must be getting the yips and he's getting the ball, but he can't do anything with it. And when he asked him to hand pass the ball to him and kick a goal and take the pressure off him, that is the best piece of team football I've ever seen because it won the game for Geelong, won him a grand final, took the pressure off Tom Hawkins. And that man, Stephen Johnson, who is probably a very nice man. I know him very well. I don't know how much intelligence he's got and I don't use that smartly. But to work that out and to do that, mm and put himself on the line. If he'd missed it, he would have yep. been laughed off yep. the ground, particularly True. when he was almost not fit to play, yep. uh, is the best piece of football I've ever seen. And people should replay that. And that's what won Geelong the game. And that's what turned them around. I'm one of the few people who call you, you your given name these days. Who is the Sam from you inherited, from whom you inherited your nickname? Bob Davis, my first coach, gave me the name Sam Newman from the Jackie Gleason show from Sammy Spear and his orchestra. Um, Bobby Davis. A little bit of travelling music, Sam, and away we go. So what was the link between I, the boy uh, we from used, the grammar and, yes. and Sammy from... We used to watch the, uh, the show, the Jackie Gleason show, and I came into training one day and I said... A little bit of travelling music, mm. Sam. And Bob Davis said, and away we go, out to training, <laughs> Sam. And uh, that's it. That's how it stuck. We've run out of time, Sammy. Oh, how disappointing. Uh, <laughs> As always, it's been interesting and entertaining. I love well, the chat. Well, go and ask one final question that you don't have to read off there. Go on. What, anything else you'd like to know about me? Anything well, what are you wearing those shoes for? What? What are they called? They're called skins. Are they? Is that the... That is the question that you thought, oh, no. <laughs> this will be a blockbuster. I'll wind this up do with you, that. Do you, do you have regrets? Is there one that, is there, I mean, I know you are believing that you can't, and we can't change what's happened, but mm. is there something where you would say, deep down, I would like my time over again? I'd like to have played in a grand final for Geelong. Mm. That's what I'd like to have done. You can't do anything about the past. There's not much you can do about the future. Uh, the present is what we live in, but I would love to have played in a grand final. I was denied the opportunity in 67, mm. uh, and that is why run regret. But it's no good worrying about things you don't have any control over, Mick. No, it is not. And it's no good crying over things that can't cry over you. Very um, philosophical, John. I've enjoyed the chat as always. Love catching up and look forward to seeing you on uh, the Nine Network on Thursday nights. Well, put it there. And I'm glad you looked at me in the eye. A lot of people don't. <laughs>
This has been a Fox Footy production.